We held the front line ahead until the following morning. The route of our withdrawal brought us once more to the ghastly place. Hanging from the wrecked trucks, limbs in crazy dislocation, were the dead. Arms and legs were strewn across the terrain, their bandages fluttering in the wind. In their panic, most of the wounded had attempted to drag themselves clear on all fours, but the majority lacked strength for the effort. Their wounds had reopened and they either bled to death or their circulatory system collapsed. The radius of the killing field, littered with corpses, extended 300 metres from the train wreck. The handful of medics and doctors had done what they could. Hope grew at our approach. A group of 50 German riflemen, half of them in need of proper medical attention themselves. The Russians were hot on our heels and would arrive within the hour. We helped by improvising stretchers and agreed on a cruel selection process, picking out those still able to walk or who had a realistic chance of surviving a stretcher journey. The remainder would be left behind. Twenty-four hours previously we had to some extent envied the wounded, since at least theoretically they had come through and were now headed for home. But now the war had seized them back, restored them to our ranks and given them the task of fighting for their lives should they wish to continue living. A pistol shot rang out. Instinctively all looked towards the report. A Jaeger, 08 in his hand, was standing over the body of one of the wounded. I strode over and asked the man, What the hell have you done? With a sob he sank to his knees, and it was a few minutes before he composed himself enough to reply. I looked at the body of his friend and neighbour, both legs amputated, the stumps ripped apart and bleeding, the upper torso riddled with steel splinters. It was incredible that he had survived so long with such injuries. The man knew he would be left behind to fall into Russian hands. When the two friends met, he had pleaded for a last act of friendship, a bullet to bring his suffering to an end. He implored so passionately that his friend fulfilled his request. This kind of thing was absolutely contrary to regulations. As we trudged away from the grim location, we hoped that the Russians, when they arrived, would care for the wounded, or at least put them swiftly out of their misery. It was an awful lot to expect. Often they tortured the wounded, and had there been no surgeons present, very possibly we would have performed a kindness for all the living we had to leave behind. I prepared my sniper's rifle and brought up the rear about 500 metres behind the main group. We had been no more than 30 minutes on the march when I became aware of a Russian assault troop not far behind. I concealed myself amongst undergrowth and rested the barrel of my rifle on the thick forked branch of a tree. My field of fire was obstructed by bushes which the Russians used skilfully for cover. Routine, intuition, and the feel for a situation inbred in the born hunter paid off in such situations. At 150 metres, I identified the platoon leader, lined the cross wires of the telescopic sight at his chest, and watched his passage through the dense vegetation. The right moment came. For a second or so, he was exposed between bushes. I squeezed the trigger and saw the impact of the projectile hurtle him backwards into the brush. His platoon was sufficiently astute to recognise the work of a sniper and sprayed out in all directions for cover. I got off two more rounds without definite result, although one hit a field flask and kept all of them low for the next half hour, gaining precious time for my retreating group. Once I rejoined them to report my success, a number of riflemen volunteered to protect the rear of our column with me, and to my surprise by evening we had remained undetected. During the night our path coincided with that of another Jaeger battalion. This provided us with a formation of respectable numbers and we soon received a signal ordering us to dig in and stem the Russian advance for as long as possible. A sharpshooter whom I knew only by repute was Josef Roth, a Nuremberger of my own age who had volunteered for the Gebirgsjäger and on his own initiative practised with a captured Russian rifle, as I had done, and found employment as a sniper. I sought him out from among the other battalion, and we got on handsomely from the start. The battalion commander knew how important it was to have snipers integrated into the defensive pattern, and allowed us a free hand. While the other riflemen dug trenches, Joseph and I carried out a joint reconnaissance of the terrain, and then settled down to work out our plan. 
we agreed that two experts working as a pair were better than marksmen operating singly. For three days the weather had been dry, with temperatures slightly above freezing. Towards eight next morning, a shot whipped into the trench diggers. A private soldier crumpled up, screaming. Like greased lightning, the others all threw themselves to the ground, bar one, who dithered a split second, debating whether he should help his fallen friend. He would never have heard the bullet which entered his skull behind the left ear and exited through the right eye, leaving a hole the size of a fist. Somebody yelled, Achtung, snipers! From their sentinel nests, the MG gunners poured streams of fire in the general direction of the presumed sniper, but without apparent effect. Joseph and I were still discussing our arrangements at battalion command when a breathless dispatch runner arrived to blurt out his report of events. The commander looked up. Well, Yaga, you know your duty, solve the problem. At a trot, keeping carefully to cover, we followed the runner to a recently finished stretch of trench where a sergeant elaborated the details. A shallow gallery led from one end of the trench into a skillfully concealed observation post amongst a clump of bushes. From this lookout position we scrutinised the terrain for all possible sniper hides, but failed to identify a spot even though we were suspicious of one particular region, because it matched the angle of fire at the end of which our two comrades had been felled. We kept a watch in vain for hours. Yosef said there was no position opposite that looked remotely ideal. At midday, while emptying a fruit tin of excrement over the trench parapet, a third Jaeger fell victim to the Russian marksman. He was somewhat luckier twice over than the other two, however, for the projectile was deflected from the rim of his steel helmet into his upper arm, where it opened a gaping wound only. Contrary to practice, the Russian had not used an explosive bullet. At that very moment, Joseph and I were observing the enemy front line through binoculars, we both noticed how the tall grass fronting a low undulation parted briefly under the pressure wave of the shot. We had to admire the ingenuity of our opponent in creating such a neat lair. He must have burrowed through the elevation from the back. The question was, did he have enough experience to abandon the position, or would he stay? The latter seemed more likely, since all three of our victims had been hit from roughly the same direction. We had to get him to show himself, and decided on the use of a lure. Joseph would take up a position about 50 metres along the trench while I remained in the observation post. We would aim and fire simultaneously at the spot where the grass moved. A scarecrow dressed in camouflage jacket and peaked field cap was prepared, and while sneaking to his position, Joseph handed the scarecrow to a rifleman halfway along with the instruction that in exactly ten minutes' time, it was to be raised cautiously until the field cap was visible above the parapet. Our two rifles were focused on the presumed hide of the Russian sniper, waiting for the scarecrow to make his debut. When it rose, the Soviet made his fatal error. He was overconfident, and that was what killed him. Clearly, he had already dismissed from his mind the idea of a lure, and was therefore not even certain of his target when he fired from an unchanged position. Hardly had his shot rang out than we replied, each using one of our precious captured explosive rounds. I watched the drama through the sight, a flurry of hectic activity and then something heavy being dragged away. A Soviet observer offered himself for death by standing up and surveying our lines through binoculars. Both bullets drilled into his head simultaneously, exploding it like an overripe pumpkin. His binoculars dropped to his chest undamaged. Now it was the turn of the Russians to cower in their dugouts, enabling our diggers to resume their excavations. Branching forward from our front line at various distances along its length were shallow communication trenches leading to a pair of MG nests. Yosef and I designed and dug six well camouflaged hides, three each, the most forward locations being situated between each MG position. This allowed us to cover no man's land in such a way that no area was obscured from our field of fire. Our plan was to keep up a lethal crossfire until the advancing Russian infantry was at hundred metres, then change to shooting directly ahead. Further down each branch were two more rearward positions for the contingency that we were spotted. This strategy worked and was a major contributory factor towards the success of our battalion in holding off the Russian attack for two days 
during which time we evacuated our wounded, including the survivors from the ambulance train. The pressure on the Nikopol bridgehead was soon irresistible, and a new encirclement began to threaten. The merged battalions were parted in the general reorganisation. Joseph and I shook hands and expressed the hope that we would meet in the future under happier circumstances. Our cooperation had proved that having a specialist observer alongside could be a decisive factor. Although after the death of Baldwin Moser I had vowed to work alone, I saw that teamwork had definite advantages, a fact of which I managed to convince my company commander to the extent that he assented to my recruiting a veteran helper whenever I considered the opportunity favourable. Our two regiments began their bitter struggle to escape the Russian encircling manoeuvre. GJR 144 was assigned the role of mounting diversionary raids aimed at keeping open important crossroads to be used by our retreating forces. Our numbers severely reduced, it was close to miraculous that we kept the line intact and even launched the odd counter-attack to give a deceptive impression of our strength. We suffered grievous losses, and the continued existence of our weakened regiment was never guaranteed, for whole companies were wiped out to the last man. On 12 February 1944, after four days of bitter fighting, the order came down to evacuate the Nikopol bridgehead. By now our regiment had been so long without supplies that we lacked heavy infantry weapons altogether, and every rifleman had a maximum of ten rounds. Since we were under continuous pressure from the enemy, the situation was extremely grave, and the few snipers were called upon to serve the role of the artillery. We were the last desperate line of defence, the last hope of holding the Soviets at a distance, and every man went to work gathering together all available Russian rifle ammunition. 3rd GD fought out of the encirclement after great effort and with heavy losses, and reached the new front line at Ingules. We were assisted by severe winter weather, ice and snowstorms, which made organised fighting impossible, but did nothing to alleviate our weakened state. In apathy we staggered across the flat step, ice crystals adhering to pinched features like needles. The Celsius thermometer read 50 below zero. Whoever stopped moving or fell in exhaustion had deadly frostbite within minutes, the hobnailed soles of our mountain boots were a conduit for the cold. If one had sweaty socks, often the skin would freeze to the boot, and then the wearer could only creep forward. The medics could do nothing to help because all liquid medications were frozen in their containers, although for the worst cases they always kept some morphine ampules available in their mouths. Wounds froze at once and became gangrenous. Fights broke out for possession of winter clothing found on stiff-frozen Russian corpses, happy the man who emerged wealthier by a snow hat or fur boots. Remorselessly the battalion pressed on. On occasion, when I stopped for a breather, I received encouragement to proceed by a kick in the rear or a prod with a rifle butt, and when necessary, I repaid the compliment. Many of our number died of the cold or total exhaustion, reducing ever lower our number of fighting fit. We dragged the wounded along with us so long as any individual retained a prospect of recovery, otherwise they were abandoned, together with the mules that could go no further, having long since consumed the last of their oats. Our ice-coated weapons were useless. The extreme cold contracted the steel to jam the breeches. The expensive precision work, which was the hallmark of the German weapons manufacturer, was now a curse. Russian weapons, with their much greater tolerances, functioned even in the lowest temperatures. Trench digging in the stone-hard ground was out of the question. Driven on by the instinct to survive, we dragged our way through the pitiless steppe as the snowstorm grew in intensity. Numb from hunger and exhaustion, I staggered through the knee-high snow, my sniper's rifle slung across my back and wrapped in a thick blanket for protection. Over my uniform I wore a padded camouflage jacket, the large hood covering my head and face. After a while there emerged through the impenetrable greyness of the storm the silhouette of a gutted farmhouse with a giant haystack alongside it. By now the cold was almost intolerable. As I turned towards it the ground gave way. With a cry I fell into an infantry trench. One of the occupants was still present, stiff as a board, a smile frozen across his features. 
Like a wild beetle, I scrambled on all fours to the surface. The farmhouse was only thirty metres distant. Suddenly movement was seen from within it, and we spread out quickly. My limbs were so cold that I could not unburden myself of the rifle. Various gyrations proved unsuccessful. We were defenceless. Scraps of Russian conversation were borne to us on the wind. Fearfully, we awaited the bursts of MG fire that would spell our doom. Nothing happened. Minutes of terrible uncertainty ticked by until it was obvious. The Russians were snowbound and unable to fight. Both sides withdrew gingerly. Night came, and the storm grew fiercer. Getting under cover now meant the difference between life and death. We slunk towards the giant haystack, the only protection far and wide against the rage of nature. We had reached the point where nobody cared any more. Shelter was all that mattered. We ran the last few metres and burrowed deeply into the warming straw. Abandoning all rules of self-protection and security, we huddled together like piglets and so survived. During the two days and nights when it raged with unrestrained fury, we suspended hostilities, for the haystack was the only chance of survival for the Russians as well. Unable to fight, the respective bitter enemies agreed to share the stack, separated by a central demarcation line. The storm abated on the morning of 20th February 1944, by which time our weapons were again serviceable. Nervously we reconnoitred the giant haystack, feeling cautiously for the Russians. They had decided that discretion was the better part of valour, and vanished into the night. A three-man patrol, waist-high in snow, inspected the farmhouse for signs of life. They came back relieved, we had the farm to ourselves. Shortly afterwards we resumed our trudge across the endless, deathly still desert of snow towards the new strongpoint at Ingoles. We had not eaten for days and were close to collapse when we stumbled into a ruined village held by our troops from whom our regiment obtained ammunition, clothing, blankets and food. As I was attached to battalion staff, I wallowed in the luxury of superior accommodation, insofar as there was such a thing, equipped with an oven. I was dozing in a cosy corner when Hauptmann Kloss returned from a regimental briefing, Trembling with cold, he crouched before the roaring fire of the stove, then thrust his soaked boots close to the warmth. A pleasant feeling of relaxation must have crept over him, for he slumped back against the wall and was soon asleep. A short while later, when I happened to glance in his direction, I noticed smoke rising from his boots. Within a few moments he jumped up with a cry of, Shit, that's hot, and began to hop around the room. His efforts to pull off the boots, though assisted by a runner, were unsuccessful. The wet leather had dried too quickly in the heat, and shrinking had moulded to his feet. The only remedy was for Kloss to sit with the boots immersed in a bucket of cold water and wait for the leather to soften and expand. To wide grins from a large assembly, the crisis was eventually overcome. Later that day, a new uniform issue was announced, and Kloss was able to exchange his leather boots for a fur-lined pair. On 25th February 1944, the Russians attacked but were repulsed by the defensive barrage of a newly operational mountain artillery regiment. Meanwhile, the infantry fell back on Ingules, where the new front line had been established. As so often in the past, it had been bungled. While officers on the spot had planned correctly for the strategic and tactical situation, OKH intervened to order the holding of utterly superfluous positions at all costs. The result was more heavy losses in men and materials, neither of which were now capable of being made good, for logistically it was no longer possible to compensate the huge drain on resources on this front even though the lines of communication were regularly shrinking in length. The military operation degenerated into a chaotic struggle to retreat in which the watchword was Sauve qui peut. The line at Ingules was a catastrophe waiting to happen. Requests to shorten the line were refused, the essential reorganisation of forces waved brusquely aside. An overstretched and ragged front line awaited Russian attacks, which were ever more gigantic. Divisions and regiments with high morale and extensive experience, such as 3rd GD, carried the hopes of local commanders. Repeatedly thrown into the thick of the fray, 
On their shoulders alone often rested the responsibility of preventing a major breach of the line and the spectre of encirclement. They had no operational security, for whatever lay to the rear was improvised. The price was insufferable losses in men and materials. On 1st March 1944, great waves of Russian foot soldiers streamed towards the German lines. Their determination on this occasion was of a special note. 3rd GD shared the sector with 1st Panzer Grenadier Division, and along this stretch the Soviets made up their losses in personnel daily, with endless marching columns of men arriving from deep in the interior. They lost a thousand men per day, while our losses were nowhere near that figure. On the third day, the Panzer Grenadiers were wiped out, and we had to plug the gap on the flank. By the fourth day, 3rd GD had shrunk to half its starting numbers, 50% having fallen in the field or been wounded and unable to continue. Although right in the centre of the fighting, I received no more than a few scratches. Once more, high morale and experience proved for some time that it could compensate for what was sadly lacking in numbers, but by the end of the fifth day, my battalion was reduced to 60. While we had been holding at bay an enemy attacking along two sides of the wedge, the sound of violent combat swelled up to our rear, and simultaneously a radio operator received a signal from battalion headquarter that they were under heavy attack and were asking for help. An enemy unit had infiltrated behind our lines and was attempting to eradicate our command centre. Thirty defenders were outnumbered three to one. A violent engagement had begun, and the defenders were now low on ammunition. The battalion headquarter structure was not intended as a fortification, and casualties were already serious. The main Russian attack on the front line was concentrated further down, so that the company commander decided to chance weakening the sector by releasing a couple of men to support the defence of battalion headquarter. This was agreed with other company commanders, who also detached a few men each. Soon the necessary battle-proven platoon had been assembled, twenty of us in all, including myself and a specially chosen observer. The report from battalion headquarter had arrived at about eight in the morning. Barely an hour later the relief platoon set off to cover the intervening 1,500 metres as quickly as possible, but with due caution, and in a quarter of an hour established contact with the enemy. Battalion headquarter was set in a depression at the foot of an imposing hill, the terrain being in the main bushy upland. We did not have the strength to hold the hill, but for the Russians it was of strategic importance since from the peak they could overlook the German positions. The defenders had withdrawn to the last remaining fortification and were almost out of ammunition. In response to the withering fire of the Russians, they replied with the occasional rifle round. The area surrounding battalion headquarter was strewn with the dead of both sides. We halted briefly to take stock. With my observer I sought out some thick vegetation which appeared to offer excellent natural cover and a relatively good view of the proceedings. As the platoon settled in, waiting for the signal to attack, my observer sized up the Russian force. Through his binoculars, he had a very wide field of sight in comparison with that available to me through my telescopic sight, and this was bound to help me raise my score of kills significantly by precise indications of where to aim. I watched as an apparently dead German infantryman with a profusely bleeding head wound tried to push himself up with his hands and was immediately cut down by a burst of Russian MG fire. His head turned into a red mass under the rain of projectiles. Small wall of earth, ten metres right, my observer muttered. Moving my rifle, I soon had the Russian in the sight, aimed at his chest, squeezed the trigger bang, dead. Perfect shot at 150 metres. This success was the signal to attack. The platoon opened fire. My own projectiles began to eat into the enemy numbers. The skirmish was short and violent. Caught in the unexpected crossfire of platoon and sniper, and horrified by their escalating losses, the Russians lost their heads. Shooting wildly in all directions, they withdrew in disorder. Twenty made it into the undergrowth. They left eighty dead and wounded behind. There was no time for anything more. After a short discussion with the battalion headquarter survivors, we headed once again for the front. Twenty minutes later, we were in our own trenches. The battle raged for six days, almost without pause. 
Towards its conclusion, we were so exhausted that it was easy to fall into a coma-like sleep during the shortest period of inactivity. The medics made regular distributions of pervitin to keep us alert. 3rd GD held its positions until 7 March 1944, even though the Soviets crossed the Ingules River the previous day and dynamited parts of the front line. The division became a thorn in their side. To remove us, the usual infantry solution was adopted once more. GJR 144 was at the heart of this pressure. When it got too hot for us, we fell back on the regimental headquarter and fought there. The command structure had ceased to function. Each group fought for itself and to survive. During this utter confusion, the order came to retreat across the Ingules forthwith. This was easier said than done. The Russians had more or less succeeded in isolating 3rd GD. Its line of supply no longer existed and the main field hospital was in Soviet hands. All that remained was a defended corridor, about one kilometre in width, through which the retreat had to be funnelled. These were the circumstances under which the few fighting fit survivors and walking wounded of GJR 144 embarked upon their withdrawal, their numbers swollen from time to time by remnants from other units. Some of the latter included four medics who had fled the Russian assault on the main field hospital. The men were in a highly agitated state and appeared close to mental breakdown, a sign of some terrible experience. A sergeant who asked of them the whys and wherefores received such irrational garble in reply that he shrugged his shoulders in bemusement and passed them to the dressing station with orders that they should be given a meal and a shot of rum. This did the trick, and after a while they were sufficiently calm to be able to deliver an account of their chilling ordeal. We shrank in horror at what they had to tell us, and heightened our will to resist Russian captivity. Not all the wounded had been allocated a berth on the ill-fated last ambulance train out of the partial encirclement. The hopeless cases had been left behind at the main field hospital under the care of a doctor and seven medics. In order to indicate that the area was hors de combat, it had been staked out with red cross and white flags, and all weapons placed in the open. It was a Mongolian unit that captured the field hospital. After moving warily from tent to tent, they surrounded the area and called upon the fascist swine inside to come out with their hands raised. The Mongols approached the medical staff nervously, weapons at the ready. Two medics emerged from the surgical operation tent. They had learnt off by heart a few sentences from a Russian phrasebook for soldiers on the Eastern Front and said, We are unarmed. Here only wounded, we surrender to the Soviet army. Hands above the head, the two medics, trembling with fear, awaited the confrontation with the Asiatic soldiers. The first came up to them and issued an order that was not understood. Immediately the Mongol rammed the stock of his machine pistol into the face of the medic, breaking his nose. Blood coursed swiftly from between his fingers, which were covering the injury to his mouth. He collapsed to the ground. The Mongol took a step back and fired a burst from his weapon into the upper torso of the injured man. At that moment the surgeon, still wearing a blood-smeared apron, emerged from the operating tent together with an assistant to find out what was going on. Four other Russians arrived, attracted by the commotion, and forced the three Germans back into the operating tent at gunpoint, screaming a series of incomprehensible orders. On the operating table lay a soldier with severe head wounds, which were being bandaged by a fourth medic. One of the Russians pushed past, drew a knife from its scabbard on his belt, and drove it into the heart of the patient through his ribcage, turned it two or three times before withdrawal and made the observation, This fascist pig is no longer required. The Germans looked on with shock, realising full well what danger they now found themselves in. They were forced into an adjoining tent in which the other, seriously wounded, had been prepared for surgery. A Mongol sergeant pushed the surgeon aside as he pleaded with the Soviet to spare the wounded. The sergeant said, Now we will show you what happens to people who invade Mother Russia and kill women and children. With a gesture to a subordinate, he indicated to the wounded men and said, Cut their throats like sheep. Wherever these people came from, they must have been expert sheep farmers and slaughterers, 
for they drew knives, honed to a fine sharpness, from inside their boots and set about the task in hand with great dexterity. Without the least sign of emotion or excitement, they raised each head and made a deep incision across the throat. The Mongols worked swiftly and expertly, and in a few minutes the operating theatre had been transformed into a human slaughterhouse. The majority did not die instantly, but bled to death where they lay. The surgeon, who confronted every day the ugliness of war, blanched and collapsed to his knees. Weakling, the Mongol sergeant said, smashing the stock of his machine pistol in the surgeon's face, adding, You pig, suck my boots. He raised the weapon by the barrel and brought it down with full force on the German's skull. Three similar blows followed to ensure death. The medics were frozen in horror in one corner of the tent. The Mongol pulled one of them to him and wiped the blood-smeared butt of the MP on his uniform. Since there were no wounded left alive in the hospital, it now occurred to the Russians to loot it. The six surviving medics were forced to sit in front of the operation tent with arms covering their heads, guarded by a single Mongol soldier, whose irritation at being excluded from the plunder was fairly evident. Shit, damn! Why have I got to stay here and look after these stupid pigs? Can I just shoot them? he asked the sergeant. Shut your mouth and do what I told you, the sergeant retorted. The old man wants to have a word with them. Perhaps we can make them sing and tell us where their heroic comrades have hidden supplies. One of the German medics understood Russian. They are going to finish us off like they did with the wounded, he whispered. We've had it in any case. At the next opportunity I suggest we make a fight of it and run. Our people can't be too far away. His comrade nodded. OK, I'll kill the Ivan, then we'll run through the operation tent, jump over the amputations trench and then dive into the bushes. We'll keep running until we're safe. Each man looks out for himself but tries to keep contact with the others. The Russians could be heard admiring their booty in loud tones, especially when they found the food store. The Mongol sentry was by now in a passioned torment and had begun to make urgent requests to his comrades to set aside his share. This was the opportunity. The Russians were rummaging through crates and boxes. The sentry watched them in annoyance and was derelict in his task. In a lightning movement, the medic drew a knife from his boot, sprang for his man like a tiger, grabbed the steel helmet by the forward rim, yanked it back into his neck, and throttling the man with the chin strap, removed him from view of his comrades. A second later, with expert anatomical knowledge, the knife went into his right kidney where it was turned in the wound three times for maximum effect. The Russian froze with the sudden terrible pain. The medic suppressed the man's groans by placing a hand over his mouth while lowering him to the ground. To finish the job, he should have cut the sentry's throat. His omission was to cost two more German lives, including his own. The German medics now darted through the long tent. They had not quite reached the far end when the death croak of the Mongol sentry reached the ears of his comrades. Several sprays of MP fire tore through the sailcloth of the tent. The last medic, bloody knife still in his hand, was hit and fell. The others kept running, leapt the open amputations trench, but the fifth caught his foot in a tent line and fell into the trench, stacked high with arms and legs. The fourth had made it to the other side, hesitated, and reached his hand towards the fifth man. As the latter rose, a burst of MP fire caught him in the back. The four survivors made the adjacent bushes and escaped. The hail of bullets fired into the thick vegetation all missed. Veterans always carried with them a small hand compass, and one of the medics had one, which saved their lives. It took them two days to hunt down the retreating German forces and elude the enemy. After reporting the names of the dead to the commanding officer, they took their place within the marching column, alone with the memory of their recent harrowing experience. We had not eaten for days. We were filthy, flea-ridden, and at the end of our physical endurance. Arriving at the new battle line, we received a briefing. The division was all but out of small arms ammunition. Everybody had to consider very carefully whether he needed to fire at any particular moment. Only the strictest self-discipline and composure would see us through in the coming battles. 
The alternative was the certainty that the front would crumble, and that meant death in Russian captivity. The private soldier needed to know no more. The German front line had developed into a bulge, which the Soviets were proposing to tie off rather like a sack. German 6th Army commanders were engaged in a last-ditch effort to stave off the threatened encirclement. However, had it not been for the lack of coordination between the various Russian armies, the pincer movement could not have been stopped. Fifteen German divisions were now concentrated into a wedge. Their purpose was to break out, cross the Ingoles River, keep going for the Bug River, cross to the West Bank, and dig in. 3rd GD had been chosen to spearhead this operation. It was first to the Ingoles and found a suitable crossing point. A battalion of sappers installed a portable dam, while Soviet attacks were disjointed and easily withstood. Meanwhile, advance units of GJR 138 and 144 occupied bridgeheads to secure the crossing and fight off any enemy response. On 15 March 1944, heavy rains preceded strong winds with violent hail and later a blizzard. Without proper shelter and lacking any hope of medical treatment, the advance guard huddled together in their holes in the ground, feverish and shivering. It was in low spirits that our motley unit plodded towards the bridgehead alongside columns of 3rd GD vehicles. The size of the evacuation lent a feeling of security. At the approach to the Ingulas, I saw through intense hail the two regimental commanders in discussion with their staffs about how to defend the crossing point. I was approaching to report my presence when, while still about 30 metres away, there came a warning shout. Achtung! Ivan! Tank! At that moment, a T-34 became dimly visible and opened fire with its MGs. A horse was hit and began to whinny pitifully while our troops dispersed and sprinted for cover. An SP gun attempted to manoeuvre into position to return fire. The horse was the personal mount of Oberst Graf von der Goltz, regimental commander GJR 138. The animal had a gaping wound in the hind quarters. Instead of seeking cover, the Oberst went to his horse. Some of the regimental staff officers had thrown themselves to the ground as the tank turret swivelled to take them under fire. Flames leapt from the muzzle of the beast's main gun and the shell, narrowly missing the prostrate officers, turned a group of vehicles into a heap of twisted and burning metal. Metal splinters hummed and whistled through the air. The belly of the horse was ripped wide open, the Oberst fell as if hit by an unseen iron fist. The German SP gun fired at the tank and hit the turret. There was a dull explosion and the T-34 burst into flame. The occupants were probably fried, for they made no attempt to escape. Within minutes the danger had passed. I saw the Oberst struggle to his feet. His right arm was gone, except for a jagged piece of bone jutting from the socket. Dumbstruck and in panic, he stared at the injury for a few seconds before collapsing unconscious. Then help came running. For me it was simply another episode in everyday life, but for the division it was a serious loss. Fonda Goltz had been an outstandingly competent leader of men and personally brave. An unconventional officer who throughout his career had been continually at odds with his superiors, with the Gebirgsjäger, he had finally discovered the kind of leadership he could live with and the opportunity to develop his abilities to the full. He was also the only third GD commander who wore the oak leaves. After a few days, I learnt that the Oberst had died of gangrene in a military hospital at Odessa. On 16th March 1944, the Russians intensified their pressure on the bridgeheads held by GJR 138 and 144. The fighting was hectic, but the defenders held out. 3rd GD was one of the last divisions across the Ingules, the tail of the withdrawal being covered by a small rearguard. Here the sniper could come into his own, holding reconnaissance platoons and infantry battle units at a suitable distance while obtaining valuable information about the enemy. During this stage of the retreat to the Bug River, our divisions were very vulnerable and it was essential to keep the enemy undecided as to our true intentions for as long as possible. The purpose of the rearguard was to offer delaying tactics until the bulk of the main force had reached its new position, to deliberately remain in contact with the enemy, 
To influence his decisions and movements in this manner required a great deal of discipline and heart, and only the veteran MG gunner or sniper could be relied upon for the kind of precision work required. Without doubt the sniper provided the most effective form of rearguard. In his disguised hide, he awaited the cautiously advancing enemy unit, observed its strength and equipment, then forced it to ground with two or three rounds of rapid accurate fire bearing the hallmark of the sniper. This was often sufficient to stop advancing infantry in their tracks for hours at a time. During the Ingoles retreat, the German units moved out at night. I remained behind in one of several carefully prepared positions that were not only well hidden, but provided some security against the effects of shelling. The important thing was that they should offer me the opportunity to make a fast escape unseen. If possible, I looked for suitable places in no man's land so that our own trenches and foxholes were included in my general scheme. When I abandoned the area, I left behind booby traps made of hand grenades and trip wires. Here the idea was to sow confusion among the enemy during his advance, forcing him to withdraw or present me with a couple of inviting targets for effect. The sport of resistance and withdrawal went on for four days. Each day I noticed how the Russians had become a little more cautious. In the end I would only manage one or two successful hits daily, for most of them went to earth and stayed there. They became expert at using cover, their preoccupation being to assume total invisibility. My first opportunity for a precise shot had been about 100 metres from my hide, probably an observer who had settled behind some bushes, but betrayed his position by moving incautiously. I noticed the unnatural movement of the leaves and on scrutiny through the telescopic sight made out his silhouette. I aimed at its centre. The hectic trembling of the bush twigs confirmed a hit. I waited on tenterhooks to see what the Russians did next. Nothing. All quiet on the Ingules front. After an hour I became jittery. Something was not right here. Intently I surveyed no man's land through binoculars but found no sign of life. My muscles ached and I felt the need for a stretch and crossed my legs. I had just laid my right foot on the left heel when I heard a rifle shot from the Russian side and felt a heavy blow to my right heel. I curled up instinctively deep in my foxhole to examine my painful injury. The entire heel had been shot off the boot and a trail of blood was oozing over the sole. I recognised at once the handiwork of a sniper and he must have been the best, both by his observation work and marksmanship. It had been a masterly shot. Now my own thought was survival. Since my hide had been identified, I could not afford to reveal an inch of myself and remained low. For the moment it seemed that the Russian was uncertain. He had no knowledge about the effect of his bullet, and so we had a standoff. Nobody on the Soviet side was prepared to risk showing himself, and my closest examination of the terrain revealed no trace of my opponent. My hope was that the latter would lie low until the fall of darkness, when I could withdraw unseen. The hours dragged until eventually the onset of night freed me from the trap. I found the exit path I had marked towards the neighbouring company's sector. Next day I remained particularly alert, but luckily my path did not again cross that of my Russian counterpart. A couple of days later the rearguard reached the Bug River and crossed to the west bank unseen. Our installations on the river bank were solid and of good quality. Having been set up two years earlier during the days of our eastward advance, and little extra work had been required to make them comfortable. Meanwhile, the Russians surprised us by leaving us entirely to our own devices, and we spent a whole week not only recuperating, but rearming and re-equipping. Even some reserves came up. It was like being on holiday. We slept eight hours per day, had regular meals and the occasional shower. But the idyll was short-lived. On the night of 26th March 1944, Using the cover of darkness, Russian assault troops crossed the bug unobserved and set up a bridgehead below the cliff where battalion was quartered. At first light, the band of toughened veterans stole into the trenches and overcame the sentries with knives and sharpened entrenching tools. No shots were fired, no prisoners taken. The day was saved by an alert MG gunner. Observing the opposite bank 200 metres away through binoculars, 
he noticed a kind of raft or float being let down into the water and quickly checked the German positions. Glimpsing for a fraction of a second the tops of two Russian helmets above the trench parapet, he raised the alarm. Shooting broke out, MPs stuttered, cries were heard. The Russian raid had been detected at last, and violent hand-to-hand -hand fighting started in the trenches. In seconds, the German defenders were wide awake, armoured and manning their positions. The Soviets had embarked upon an amphibious crossing of the Bogue, mindless of the murderous defensive fire. Since they had neglected to bring up a single artillery piece to cover them, relying entirely on the element of surprise, we held all the trumps and the invasion from the river was soon in serious difficulties. However, a dangerous situation was developing in the trenches, which we had begun to lose piecemeal section by section. A group had been formed to repulse the infiltration, and this had been partially successful, but the Russians were hanging on to what they had captured, as if their lives depended on it. I was picking off Russians in the boats one by one when an NCO, watching the fighting in the trenches through field glasses, drew my attention to a soldier wearing a white fur cap, apparently the group commander who was continually seen in the midst of the fighting and seemed to be animating the fierce Russian resistance. I think the fine fur cap over there is the leader. If you can knock him out, our people can finish the rest off. I knew how an officer leading his men in the thick of things could motivate people to fight and the demoralising effect when he fell. With a couple of strides I reached a bend in the trench complex from where I had a good field of fire and a place to rest my rifle. With regard to the importance of the task in hand, I decided to expend one of my precious explosive rounds. These were found only rarely in captured ammunition. I prepared the weapon and awaited my chance for the fatal shot. The NCO was my observer, watching the opposite trench through his binoculars. Suddenly the fur cap appeared above the trench parapet. There, Sep, to the right, the NCO yelled. I swung the weapon, but the target had already disappeared. Sep, he's making to the right. Wait a bit and you'll see the cap appear above the trench. I had worked out the rhythm of my opponent. He would soon pass across the sapper's entrance, giving me a split second to shoot him. I aimed the crosswires of the site on the entrance at head height and awaited the decisive moment. Suddenly, 120 metres distant, the target head filled the sight, my shot rang out and hit. Through our respective optics, the NCO and I saw the white fur cap swell like a balloon, then burst like an overripe watermelon. Deprived of their commander, the Russians appeared at once confused and disoriented. Our own assault force used the opportunity to storm the occupied trenches. In the ensuing fighting, the veteran invaders were wiped out to the last man. I returned my attentions to the riverborne invasion force immediately, and my observer had taken up his carbine. The value of the sniper lies in his ability to distribute a rapid and very accurate fire. The infantry aboard the boats and floats, recognising that they posed an easy target from the shore, had disembarked very early from the craft in the effort to escape the withering fire. Firing at the heads in the water was just target practice for the sniper. The Russians gave no heed to casualties, and the water was red with their blood, rather like the waste drain at a slaughterhouse. A bloody broth of corpses, limbs and internal body organs drifted gently down the stream towards the Black Sea. A neighbouring sector of the line was captured by the Soviets, but despite the exposed flank, GJR-144 repelled everything the Russians could throw at it and held its trenches until 27 March 1944, when 3rd GD was ordered to retire to the Dnester, 300 kilometres to the southwest. This involved a 48-hour enforced march to get clear of the area, but the Russians were wise to it, having learnt their First World War lessons well and kept on our heels. To add to our problems, the supply line had been severed and we received no ammunition, provisions and, worst of all, no anti-tank weapons. The last lorry to get through brought two tonnes of bitter chocolate and five hundred iron crosses. This kind of administrative lunacy drove us to despair. The daily fare was now half a bar of bitter chocolate and a ship's biscuit, rich in ballast and very good for those vulnerable to loose motions. 
The two days' forced march failed to bring about the hoped-for respite. The Russians maintained their stranglehold on the division, and the retreat soon degenerated into an ugly free-for-all without well-drawn battle lines. The Soviets were everywhere, creating islands of German resistance that had no option but to fight on alone in the hope of regaining contact later with the main group. The Russian infantry had a new battlefield vehicle, armoured half-tracks for infantry transport supplied under the terms of the US Lend-Lease Pact. These machines were obviously very useful for getting Russian soldiers into and behind our lines, where they would disembark and immediately start fighting. The danger could be averted with anti-tank guns, but we had nothing more powerful than hand grenades to do the job. With a rumble of motor and a clanking of tread, the half-tracks made for our positions. With no time to spare, we discussed quickly how we were to combat this new peril, since hand grenades seemed so unpromising a solution. Through field glasses I examined the approaching vehicles for a weak point. The front was armour-plated with the driver located in a wheelhouse, vision being afforded by a viewing slit small in size. In my estimation, the chance of a hit with a rifle shot was not good, but was probably the only way to stop the vehicle. I took careful note of the intervening terrain for likely course changes. The half-track was moving at walking pace. I loaded one explosive round and rolled a tent into a rest for the rifle barrel, aimed the weapon and watched the approach for my chance. Taking calm, measured breaths, I got the viewing slit in the cross wires and took up some pressure on the trigger. The machine was about 60 metres off when for a brief moment I saw the eyes of the driver through the viewing slit, possibly judging the ground ahead. I fired. A hit. At once the vehicle slewed and rutted sideways into a shell crater, the tracks continuing to turn and ensuring that it got well and truly stuck. The incumbent Russian soldiers abandoned the useless conveyance in panic, and being met at once by heavy fire from our riflemen, were forced back into the crater for protection. It appeared that the driver's cabin was partitioned off from the passenger area, making it impossible to relieve him at the controls in an emergency. I had found the Achilles' heel, and hopes grew that this might be the answer. Using my last twenty explosive rounds, I managed to kill or wound seven of the twelve half-track drivers that day. The other five got through our lines to unload their human freight, but the latter was not quality material and none lived to tell the tale. Although I had been successful, neighbouring divisions were breached at many points, forcing us to pull back yet again to an organised defensive line. To our astonishment, OKH sent to our aid a number of Romanian bomber aircraft and an anti-tank detachment. They destroyed 24 Russian tanks and gave us the breathing space needed to construct a new defensive line. After fighting for months without air support, the sight of friendly aircraft seemed almost surreal. Nevertheless, the regiment remained under severe pressure. Although the line held, we lost a third of our fighting personnel. Eventually the Soviets gave it up and switched their effort to a much weaker sector a few kilometres further on. A unit composed mainly of youngsters fresh from basic training was wiped out. In the uncanny silence, the men of GJR 144 grabbed a few hours' desperately needed sleep. On 2nd April 1944, Russian armour broke through the lines and encircled 3rd GD. There was no time to waste before attempting to escape. A very risky operation beckoned since we were equipped only with small arms and grenades, our only ally being the very inclement weather. That evening... In a blizzard reducing visibility to 50 metres, the thousand or so survivors of the regiment left their positions to form a long column two or three abreast. Everything possible was done to bring along the wounded. A fate worse than death awaited those who fell into the hands of the Russians. At the last farewell, many of the wounded requested a pistol to determine for themselves the hour of their passing. A final handshake of mutual understanding then the blizzard separated us from them forever. While still in earshot, we heard the first pistol shots ring out. As usual, I had my sniper's rifle wrapped in a tent and slung across my back, and carried an MP40 at the breast for ready use. I was a member of the platoon protecting the right flank. We had been on the way for about an hour, 
when I heard marching feet and snatches of conversation a few metres away to the right. I assumed that I had caught up with other platoon members in the poor visibility and fell back a little. Several minutes later a number of shadows became visible, and I froze in horror as I heard the Russian in which they were conversing. We were marching parallel to a Soviet phalanx. I slipped away to rejoin our column, and my expression was enough to convey the situation. Rapid hand signals passed from man to man. No word was spoken. Hardly daring to breathe, we bore away from the Russian unit. A short while later, but still enveloped in the darkness of early morning, the division came to a buzzy highway that crossed our direction of retreat. After an hour of watching the soldiery and traffic passing along it, the commander formed the opinion that we could not get the whole regiment across the highway without the procedure being seen, and the order was given to stage a surprise raid as a diversionary measure. The assault platoon, five veterans and myself, lurked in the vegetation watching the passage of a supply column. Using a 40-metre gap between lorries, we sprang out a few metres in front of the oncoming vehicle and sprayed the driver's cab with a burst of MP40 fire. Two of us lobbed grenades into the interior from the rear. The lorry sheared towards the undergrowth, and as the grenades exploded, came to a rest at an angle straddling a ditch. The cab door opened, and in the pale light of the burning interior, the driver stood for a brief moment, streaming blood and gurgling, before pitching face forward to the ground. At once we switched attention to the next lorry, while the various companies of our regiment scurried across the highway. Within a few minutes the darkness had swallowed them up. We suffered no casualties. After regrouping we continued our trudge towards the estuary of the Kutschurgen River. Our retreat ended 25 kilometres short of this natural defensive barrier near the town of Bakalov. Russian armour had already taken it and encircled five German divisions, 3rd GD and 17, 258, 294 and 302 infantry divisions in the process. The pocket was eight kilometres long by four broad. Bakalov town was along the western perimeter, the highest topographical point being 140 metres. The German units were in a desperate plight, battalions being composed of half-strength companies armed only with light infantry weapons and grenades. The men were starving and in poor physical condition, but the fear of falling into Russian hands had concentrated their minds powerfully. Wittmann, commanding General 3rd GD, was in overall command, his immediate priority being to break out of the encirclement and reach the German lines along the west bank of the Kutschurgen. Besides the failure of logistics, the communications network had collapsed and messages were being passed by runners, wasting valuable hours that should have been devoted to planning the breakout strategy. The plan was finally settled upon during the afternoon of 5th April 1944, and at five o'clock third, GD spearheaded the assault on Bakalov. The Russians were clearly surprised at the fighting spirit of these worn-down German troops and offered so little resistance that Bakalov was in our hands by nine that evening. GJR 144 took over a small village a few kilometres west of the town. This strategy had come into being following the receipt of information regarding a second encirclement nearby, of which 24 Army Corps was the victim. In order to kill two birds with one stone and give the breakout operation greater impact, General Wittmann decided that the two encirclements should be breached in concert, his main fear being that the Army Corps movement would be too slow and stall. Unfortunately, he could not contact 24 Army Corps, so in order to bring his plan to fruition, he took the dangerous step of suspending his own operation, capturing Bakalov and aiding the Army Corps by having his own divisions bear the brunt of the Russian attack, GJR 144 being among them. The village, whose name I do not recall, was on the northwest perimeter of the encirclement, a typical rural hamlet of the region, twenty or so rude adobe dwellings with thatched roofs against a backdrop of scanty woodland. Together with ten riflemen I took possession of the ruins of an outlying farmhouse and prepared four hides with good cover and field of fire, special care being paid to rapid and protected movement between the five sites. From about seven on the evening of 6 April, the Russians began probing the perimeter at various places, 
and just before half nine the village dwellings were set alight as the prelude to a Cossack cavalry attack at a fast gallop. Highly mobile, they were quickly up to our positions, and in the flickering light of the fires it was almost impossible to get a clear shot at the riders. Accordingly, no matter how much we regretted it, we had to target the horses. I knew the neuralgic spots to aim for from my experiences sniping at Russian transport horses. If the bullet hit around the breastbone, the animal would collapse at once, often falling on the unseated rider. If hit in the kidney intestinal region, the beast would rear up uncontrollably and eventually collapse, death following violent convulsions of the legs. I decided to aim for the breastbone, if possible, and the midriff of those horses further away. The riflemen of my platoon would then pick off the Cossacks at leisure, 